to listen again to your inspiration. Help us to open our hearts, to heed what you are asking. Let us be attentive, let us grow, and in all things may we always praise you. And we ask this grace through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So now we're just waiting for Steve Rain to begin. Steve, thank you again for being with us, and welcome back. Okay, Steve, we see you there. Welcome back at one o'clock Pacific, four o'clock Eastern time, and wherever you are somewhere in the world, we are going to spotlight your video as you get yourself ready and you invite go. you back. You have, uh, as I said, 90 minutes, so we're happy to have you as long as you're able to stay with us. And as long as my voice holds up. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Steve. I said my, my voice, uh, wife said my voice is getting raspy, but that's all right. We'll make do here. Um, our conversion story. I've told this over a thousand times, I'm sure. I've told it on every single bus we've ever taken to Israel, and that alone is almost a hundred buses. And I know I've given it at conferences all over the world, so I never get tired of telling this story. Um, I love to tell it. I want to start out by showing you a picture of our family now. That is uh, a year ago. We have actually two more babies now since that time. So we have uh, four kids and they all got married. They all own their own houses now and uh, 18 grandkids. So it just started out with six of us and now we're 26. And uh, all of them are doing great. And I have one of my grandsons the oldest one who's already said papa can you pray for me and i said what do you want me to pray for you dominic and he says i i think i want to be a priest i think god wants me to be a priest so uh, we have some wonderful kid grandkids anyway uh my our story begins normally i start it with my parents i guess that's where everybody's story begins and my mom and dad were from illinois and they were i call them good American pagans. They didn't have any religious upbringing at all. My dad was a farm boy. My city, my mom was a city girl, and they didn't have any upbringing at all. They were, uh, they had unusual families. My mom's family, her family divorced when she was three years old, and that's traumatic for kids today, but imagine that happening when you're three years old back in the early 30s. And they got married young, and my dad and mom had two kids, my older brother and sister. They had then 12 years of miscarriages, and my mom was desperate for more kids, And but they didn't know how to pray. They didn't go to church or anything, but she just wanted more kids real bad. Well, after they moved to Detroit, and my dad got a job. He, Henry Ford hired my dad personally. I still have the letter in my office signed by Henry Ford II, who invited my dad to come to Detroit. And it was during World War II, and they were building all the, um, the tanks and the aircraft and so on. And my dad came here, and they lived in Detroit. And my mom says one day in 1953, and here's where the real story begins. She said she, was, she got up one morning, and dad went to work, and she was going to go shopping, and she's cleaning up the kitchen, getting everything ready. She said she turned on the radio and was listening to the radio while she's getting ready to go. And she said, I, I had my purse and my keys, and I was heading towards the door when I heard this very urgent voice. This man was talking about things I had never heard before in my life. I never knew any of this, but he was telling me that God loved me and that I was a sinner and I was going to hell. And, and my mom is 98 and a half years old. In fact, I just talked to her between, in the break here just to say hello to her. I try to call her every day. She's still very alert. We can't visit her because of this whole virus thing. But even when I talk to her, go visit her when I can uh, after this, or she'll tell me again the story of this 
voice that she heard on the radio and telling her she was a sinner and that God loved her so much he sent his only begotten son down who died on the cross and shed his precious blood that if she would accept Jesus as her personal Lord and Savior and invite him into her heart that she'd be saved and go to heaven she'd miss hell and she said Steve I never heard anything like that before she said I was so overcome with emotion and with excitement about this she said I fell on my knees on the floor I dropped my purse and my keys and I prayed and I said dear God save me like that man just said on the radio the man she heard on the radio was the Reverend Billy Graham. He came to Detroit for, uh, for some crusades in 1954, and she heard him on the radio the next day. And she said it just totally changed her life. She said from that moment on, I was, she was a Christian. She had a lot to learn, but she was now so excited that she had found Jesus. My dad at the same time thought he was having a nervous breakdown. He thought he had cancer or something. He didn't, obviously, because he lived to be 94 years old. He, was, he, he and my mom were married for 73 years, and they um, were a good example to me. And my dad went out on the porch on Marlowe Street in Detroit, Michigan, where they lived at the time, and he sat on the steps, and he said, I looked up to heaven, and I said, Jesus, if you're there, if there's a God, please reveal yourself to me, because I'm desperate and I need to know if you're really there. My dad went to bed that night, got up the next morning and he went to Ford Motor Company where he worked. And he said that the first thing that happened when he got to work was a man came up to my dad and his name was Ed Daring. And he said to my dad, Charlie, he says, I need to tell you something. And my dad says, what? And he said, Charlie Ray, you need Jesus Christ in your life. That was only 12 hours after my dad prayed. This man comes up and tells my dad he needs Jesus Christ in his life. Well, so certainly my dad becomes a Christian at that moment. He prays right at that moment. And um, what I like to ask people, though, is, first of all, do you think that was an answer to prayer? 12 hours later, this man comes and says this to my dad. Of course, that was an answer to prayer. That just shows how God is there and ready if we're ready. And if we ask, he'll do something to help us. The second question I like to ask people is, do you think it was a Catholic that came to my dad and asked him that question? When I ask if it's a Catholic, most people <laughs> they chuckle, they say, no. But isn't that a sad commentary on, on the Catholic, general Catholic population of our country today? That when you ask, is it a Catholic who talks to someone about Jesus, they automatically say, well, no, we don't do that. Well, you're right. The man was actually a Baptist. And he talked to my dad from the Baptist tradition. And my mom and dad joined Joy Road Baptist Church in Detroit, Michigan. My mom says the first thing she did was she prayed and asked God to give her more children. She said, after 12 years of miscarriages, Jesus, now that I found you, will you give me more kids? And if you do, I'll give them Bible names. And I'll be so grateful and I'll raise them for you. My mom said that if I had come earlier, she would have screwed up our childhood. And it was after she found Jesus that he gave her kids. And I have to say, she was correct. When we were born and I had two brothers that came after me, she kept her promise about the Bible names. I was named Stephen, then came David, and then came Timothy. And we were, I will say before I go any further than this, that in my conversion story, I'm pretty tough on Protestantism. I'm pretty tough on the theology that I was raised with, and I tell about how I came to be Catholic, but I want people to know that even though I was an anti-Catholic when I was a Protestant, I am not an anti-Protestant now that I'm a Catholic. I have nothing but love and respect for the way my parents raised me, and the way they taught me about Jesus, and the way that they helped me to understand the Bible, and to love God, and to want to get to heaven and miss hell, but I think that the thing I'm most grateful to my mom and dad for is that they showed me what it was like to live a Christian life, and they showed me what it was like to be married and have a family. My mom and dad spent the first hour of every day praying and reading the Bible together, and though they had arguments and fights periodically, they always worked them out, and we never were afraid of a divorce in the family. We knew mom and dad loved each other, and they loved Jesus, and they showed us what it was like to live a holy life, but they also gave me schooling on what it was to be a parent and a husband. So when I ended up marrying my wife, 
she coming from a similar background, it was very easy for us to be married because we had this wonderful example of Christian parents who loved each other, were committed to each other. And when my wife and I got married, we had a two point mission plan. It was like a business plan. Mission statement was two points. Number one, based on how we had seen our parents grow, uh, live, we decided that we were going to prove to the world that a man and a woman could be married for a lifetime in a monogamous relationship under Jesus Christ as the Lord of our life and make it work. And second point, we could raise kids that also love Jesus and also would be faithful to him. So that was what we decided to do and praise God it worked. Now, my mom and dad knew that, so and I'll finish that, that I'm not an anti-Protestant. I have great respect for that. So that even though I'm tough on Protestant theology and some of the things that we were taught, I want people to know that I accept those Christians who name the name of our Lord, who have been baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, who recite the creed with me, who are willing to shed their blood for Jesus with me and willing to stand in front of an abortion clinic with me, that we know that those are our brothers and sisters in Christ, though separated from the visible bounds of the Catholic Church. And I'm going to get to that at the end. But we have uh, love and respect for evangelicals. But at the same time, I do not consider evangelism to be finished until all of us are at one table eating one meal in one house together, meaning the Catholic Church. So even though I can accept the evangelical Protestants as my brothers and sisters in Christ, evangelism doesn't end until they're back in the one church together with us. I know that sounds unecumenical, but actually that's the way it is. There is one body of Christ and we should all be one. The fathers of the church says you don't cut arms off and legs off and scatter the body in different people. We're supposed to be one body. And the problem is, is that for evangelical Protestants, they have no place in their theology for one universal organizational church. For them, the universality of the church or the oneness of the church is in spirit, not in physical unity. The problem with that, of course, is Jesus said, I pray that all of you will be perfected in unity so that the world knows that the Father sent the Son. The world has to be able to see the visible unity of all Christians together, not just in spirit, but in theology and in organization. They need to be able to see all of us together as a family. When they see the confusion and the disorientation and the sects and denominations, the world has the right to say, we do not see you unified in unity. Therefore, we have the right to say the Father did not send the Son. And the disunity of Christianity is a scandal. And Gandhi in, in, uh, in India said, if all Christians were united together as one, India would fall at the feet of Jesus Christ in 24 hours. We're our own worst enemy sometimes. Christians by being fragmented and separated, which is one of the reasons why I became Catholic, because I wanted to be part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, and then start helping everybody else to come back to that position. So my mom and dad wanted us to grow up to be good Baptist kids. And one of the things you have to do is memorize Bible verses. So we would have the Bible, and we would do sword drills. The Bible's called the sword of the spirit. And so we'd have sword drills. We'd have the boys on one side and the girls on the other side. And they'd call out a Bible verse. And whoever could find it in the Bible and stand up and read it first would win the point. And that's the way I was raised. And my mom paid us 50 cents to memorize Bible verses. So we were, <clears throat> I was a rich little kid. had a lot of quarters in my pocket because I had a quick mind. And I loved to memorize. And I loved having lots of money in my pocket as I grew up. First verse we learned was, for God so loved the world, he gave his own. Uh oh, I'm sorry. I already made a mistake. That's John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, who are believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3, 16, you have to cite the book, chapter, and verse so that you always know where they are. My mom said, it's a big book, Steve, and the more verses you memorize and where they are, it becomes smaller, it becomes your book. And I cannot thank my mom enough for imposing upon me and impressing upon me the need to memorize scripture. And I think it should be something every Catholic kid 
should have to do. That should be part of the daily routine in a Catholic family to memorize verses together. Even if at every meal, even take one, one verse a week and recite it together at dinner until everybody's got it memorized, can do it at drop of hat and then pull out another verse and memorize. There are so many good verses to memorize and that they give us a renewing of our mind. And then those verses are there when temptation comes or when we have theological discussions or whatever. <clears throat> okay. So we had to learn those verses. Another thing that we had to do was this. I don't know many people that can do this, but we had to start this at eight years old. Take a deep breath. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 1 Second Kings, 1 Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalm, Prophets, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zay, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Naaman, Vak, Except, Nah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Those are the books of the Old Testament. I could have kept going through the New Testament as well, but we had to learn that when we were eight years old. We also got to the point where we could say it backwards as well. And then we got to the point where we could say Genesis 50 chapters, Exodus 40 chapters, Leviticus 27 chapters, and go all the way through. Now, even if I made a mistake, you wouldn't have known it. But I did make a mistake. Does anybody know what it is? I wish you could talk back to me. If we were in a real auditorium or at the, at the mother house, or you could, we could respond. But the, the, reason, the thing I did get wrong is I left seven books out of that list because I was quoting to you the Protestant list of Old Testament books, not the Catholic list. The Catholic Bible is bigger by seven books which Martin Luther and the Protestants took out of the Old Testament and left themselves with only 66 books, whereas the Catholic Bible from the beginning had 73. So we learned the Bible verses, and we had a great childhood. Mom and dad were great mom and dad. They taught us how to live a holy life, how to be. We had a great time. We lived out in the country. We had ponies and a pool, swimming pool, little swimming pool. Stuff. It was a wonderful life. When I got 15 years old, I got stubborn. I'll tell you when that happened, and then I'll date myself. I was graduated from high school in 1973. I'll be 66 years old this December. So now you know how old I am. I'm getting old. So I'll be 66 this December. And when I was 15, back in the late 60s, a lot of people know at my age, what was going on there with the sexual revolution and the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and drugs and all of the chaos and rebellion and it's going on at the time. And I was in high school at that time. And I have to say that for two years, I made my mom and dad a lot of problems. I was a rebel. I grew my hair long. I know you can't believe it now when you see what I look like now. But at that time, my hair was all the way down on my shoulders along like a lion's mane and I had bell-bottom blue jeans and I was a rebel. I had no idea what I was gonna do other than I just wanted to be wild. And that went on for two years and I brought my mom and dad a lot of grief. And uh, they, were, they handled it well, I think, but I did bring them a lot of grief. Then something happened to me. When I was 17 years old, it was summer vacation. And my mom, had the radio on and Billy Graham was giving a talk. Billy Graham's had a big part to play in our family, I think. <clears throat> and I remember hearing Billy Graham on the radio and here I am with my bell-bottom blue jeans and my long hair and every ounce of me an energetic rebel. But that struck me that night when I heard him preach and he said, God has a plan for your life. Well, I didn't know what I was gonna do. And he said, you can put your name in there. For God so loved Steve Ray, he gave his only begotten son. That if Steve Ray will believe in him, he'll not perish but have everlasting life. Obviously, he didn't know my name, but he said, you can put your name in there. And I certainly did at that point. And I got tears welling up in my eyes. I know it was the Holy Spirit. My mom and dad's prayers for me worked. God never let me get too far away. Then I remember at the end, if you've ever heard of Billy Graham crusade, George Beverly Shea with his beautiful baritone voice starts singing at the end, just as I am without one plea, but that your blood was shed for me. I can get choked up real easy even now when I hear those good old Baptist hymns. I remember my dad singing them. <clears throat> well, when that happened and I heard that, Tears welled up in my eyes. 
and I slipped out the back door of the house. I didn't want mom and dad to see me emotional about Billy Graham and about Jesus. And we lived in the country, and I walked out the country road, trees down as Napier Road, I'll still read, and I can't forget it today. And I remember looking up as I walked along and realizing how small I was looking out at the stars. And I just said a very simple sentence. Jesus, I'm only 17 years old, but tonight I'm going to give my life to you. Excuse me. It happens every time. Someday I'll be able to tell this without that happening, hopefully. But I said, I'm only 17 years old, but I'm going to give my life to you. You're going to be my Lord and Savior, and I'm going to live every day of my life for you. And I was 17 years old, and I have to say that that was a turning point in my life, the most important thing I ever did. It set the trajectory. When you have a rocket ship and you set it off, it has a trajectory, and you know where it's going to go. And that was the tra trajectory of my life. And I have lived it better some days than others but it's never been forgotten. And it has always been the trajectory of the distance that I was going to go, what I was going to do to serve Jesus Christ. I went back to high school that year. I was in 12th grade. And in our high school, it was a very rough year. They used to have police that came in. There was, I think, 1,200 graduating students, a huge school, Plymouth Canton uh, in Michigan. And they used to have police coming in all the time for raids, for drugs, and for sex, and everything else. It was a crazy time. And I went back to school that year, convinced and convicted that I was going to get every person in that school saved and following Jesus Christ. I went back with my long hair and my bell-bottom blue jeans. That part didn't change, but the whole inner part of me did. And I went back to school, and I was going to get everyone to know Jesus Christ. And I have to say that with a couple of friends that I made, we had over 200 kids who used to be on drugs that would get together over lunch and study the Bible together. I don't know what happened to any of those kids. We didn't have the church to get them involved in, but at least that's what we did. But on the first day of school, I had some guys come up to me and said, Steve, there's a girl who just moved here from California. She just found Jesus too. She found Jesus in California and her dad came here to work at Ford's and, and we, you got to meet her. So they brought this girl to me and to just backtrack a bit, she had been born and raised in a Presbyterian church, not real evangelical kind. It was more of a nominal church, but she had been raised that way. But she had gone to a group that was called Calvary Chapel, and they had a Bible study in the school. Can you imagine having Bible studies in a public school today? And she did, and she found Jesus in a personal way during that Bible study. And she was baptized by the pastor of Calvary Chapel. His name was Pastor Chuck Smith. And she was baptized by Pastor Chuck Smith in Pirate's Cove in the Atlantic Ocean, at Costa Mesa, California, where she had been from. And for those who don't know what Calvary Chapel is, I know I'm speaking to a lot of people on the West Coast, so you may know more than the people on the East Coast, but their congregations are growing. And what they boast is that 80%, 80% of their members are former Catholics, ex-Catholics. And they train those 80% of ex-Catholics to go out and make more ex-Catholics. And their targets are your kids and your grandkids. And they are good at it. If your kids and grandkids don't know the faith and how to explain it and defend it. Well, this girl was all excited about that. I met her in the hallway the first day of school. They introduced her to me and we got talking. She told me later that God spoke to her in, in her heart that day. It's not a voice, but she said it was the first time in her life that she knew God spoke to her. And she said, that's the man you're going to marry. And four years later, we got married. <laughs> I'll just show you here real quick a couple things while I catch my emotions here. There's a picture of me with my brothers and my mom and dad. That's when I was about maybe four, 12 or 14 years old. I'm the one in the uh, plaid suit coat and my mom and dad and my brothers. And then here is a picture of the cute blonde girl I met at high school who was from Costa Mesa. Her name was Janet. And four years later, this took place. We got married. See, I did have hair. See, I told you I had hair, but I'd gotten it cut pretty short by the time we got married. 
Well, anyway, you know, that's one of the things I can't do when I'm giving a talk to an audience. I can't show you the pictures because you're way too far away. But this, this, is, this is one of the nice benefits of this. Well, we got married and uh, four years later, and we were going to a very, <clears throat> I usually don't add this point, but I have a few extra minutes, so I'm going to add this point. We got going to a very small, what we would have called a New Testament fellowship back in those days there was a lot of groups just starting their own churches. And there was a group of guys that got together and started their own churches. They thought they'd go back to the New Testament and they would find the blueprint for the church and they would recreate the church today. So obviously not the Catholics. They've got all that Catholic stuff like sacraments and Mary and Popes. And that's not what it was like in the book of Acts. And it's certainly not the Baptists because they don't do this. And, they, and we were the only ones who knew the truth. And we went to the New Testament and we started our own little thing that we were going to do. And we were there for probably five, four or five years. And it got very cultish, very authoritarian, which is a kind of thing that often happens when you have these kind of little churches that grow up and think you're the only one that has the truth and everybody has to follow this charismatic leader. And finally, we broke away from that. But we learned a lot during that process. We learned a lot about what the church wasn't. But then that, we didn't still find the Catholic church at that point. So we were married and we had four kids. I had my own business. I started it out of our dining room after we got married and we built it up to $12 million business with 600 employees. And after I became Catholic, I sold it because I couldn't do that anymore. I just did not enjoy my business. I fell in love with teaching, traveling, studying the Bible, going to these leading pilgrimages, making movies about the story of salvation and all of the things like what I'm doing right now. That's what I fell in love with. So my wife said to me, she's a good wife. She said, Steve, God gave you a gift to teach. I think he's given you a gift to teach. And if we don't do something with that gift, we're going to be in big trouble on judgment day. So why don't we sell the business and let's do this? And she's been at my right hand ever all the whole time. I'm the best wife in the world. Well, we've been married now 41 years. So we got married and had kids. Everything was going fine. I loved being an evangelical Protestant. I was never a pastor. Like some of the converts, I was never a pastor. Although I did teach Bible studies in a lot of different Protestant churches, Baptist and Evangelical Presbyterian. We spent a year of our life. We left, we sold everything we had everything we had. I kept my business. I had some people running it for me. So, but we left and sold everything we had and took two kids in diapers and we moved to the Swiss chalet, uh, Swiss Alps. And we lived in a chalet with a th near a theologian named Dr. Francis Schaefer. He's kind of the number one favorite uh, evangelical um, philosopher, teacher evangelist of the seventies and eighties. And we studied with him there for a year in Europe and traveled all over Europe. And then we came back and God did a lot of miracles in our life during that time. He was very gracious to us. I could do a whole hour just telling out the miracles in that story. But when we came back, I did a lot of teaching in churches and I had a, we had a Bible study in our house. We used to have 50 people every fr a Monday night come and they'd be sitting all over the chairs and the couches, even up the stairs and everything. And we did that for eight or 10 years and we loved it. And I was an evangelist. I remember we'd go out and do evangelism and, tell Catholics they need to get saved. And I taught classes on how to get people saved, not just Catholics. You were the biggest cult, but also Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and atheists and everything else. So when our kids grew up, they grew up um, to, as a part of all of this, they were part of this dynamic evangelistic Bible studying family. This is one of the reasons why I attribute the fact that our kids have grown up to love the Lord too and raise their kids that way because kids will love what their parents love. Not every time, but there's a basic rule is that kids will love what their parents love. And we love Jesus and we loved being Christians and we love studying the Bible. And I can't tell you how many evenings our kids would sit around the living room while we would have the Jehovah's Witnesses who knocked on our door come in and we would talk to them for an hour and they'd come back with their big guy leader and we'd debate for another hour. And then they would put a band, never allow, never Jehovah's Witnesses are ever allowed to go to Steve Ray's house again. They had like a big X on our door. They wouldn't come again. But then the Mormons would come and our kids would love sitting around listening to dad debating with these guys and the atheists would we sometimes but anyway this is this is why i think parents 
with your kids if you love the faith. Kids are going to love what you love. If you love sports and that's all you care about, that's what your kids are going to care about. Sports are great. I love sports. But if that's the God of your life, guess what your kids are going to adapt as the God of their life? When people say, what should we do with our family? I said, genuinely love Jesus and his church and make it so contagious that your kids can't stand it. And also tell them that your family is a special club. It's a special, unique club. It's nobody else can get into this club. It's exclusive. You have to get born into this club. And don't you dare do anything so stupid as to get kicked out of this club or to leave the club. So the kids always view the family. This is something we want to stay part of, you know. And, and to this day, I love it. They're our best friends. But families, but I'm just off track here a little bit, but families don't just happen by chance. They're a great piece of artwork and it takes a lifetime to make this masterpiece. And it takes all your attention. Anyway, so we raised our family that way. And then in 1993, at the end of the year, we became Catholics in 1994. And people say, oh, well, what in the world happened? You were teaching classes against the Catholic Church. You were anti-Catholic. What in the world made you want to become a Catholic? And I say, well, they say, was it something you discovered about the Catholic Church that was so beautiful you just couldn't wait to be a Catholic? Or was it you knew wonderful Catholic people who made you want to be like them? I say to both questions, absolutely not. I never saw anything good about the Catholic Church. And all the Catholics I knew at that time were good excuses and reasons why not to be a Catholic. The Catholic Church was like a big oak tree in a field, a big, beautiful oak tree. But I couldn't see it because it had been shrouded by a mist and a fog of lies, caricatures, misrepresentations about what the Catholic Church was. I had never read, read a Catholic book. At the time of my wife and I deciding to become Catholic in 1994, we had never once set foot inside a Catholic church. We had never met a Catholic priest out of principle. And we had never met a Catholic who could explain or defend their faith. I didn't come into the church because I saw how beautiful it was because I didn't see it at all. It was a big, ugly thing, and it was hiding behind a mist of lies and misinformation. My journey and my wife's journey to the Catholic Church began when we began to see the problems with Protestantism. I say sometimes you don't go to a doctor until you get sick and you need to go to the doctor. I realized that there was something wrong with our evangelical Protestantism, and it was like realizing there was something deficient before I realized I had to go to the doctor. Now, what were those things? I'm going to break them into three for you. Three biggest problems we saw in Protestantism that drove us to the unthinkable, the Catholic Church. So we'll start with this way. One was, what is worship? Number two, what is the authority for Christians? Number three, how many churches did Jesus start? Those three were the biggies. I could go through a lot more, but I'm going to just break these down for you. I'm going to start with, what is worship? My wife, Janet, was coming home with me from church one Sunday at the Evangelical Presbyterian Church. I taught a Bible study in the Sunday school, and we went to the church part, and we said we we're worshiping there at the worship service, and then we drove home. On the way home, my wife said, Steve, I can't go listen to that pre preacher anymore and listen to that preacher and call it worship. It may have been good preaching and singing, but it's not worship the way God wants us to worship. Something's missing, but I don't know what it is. Little did I know. But that was the beginning of our conversion. Because what Janet was missing is what all of you Catholics know, and that is the Eucharist, the holy sacrifice of the Mass. And the Catholic Church has always taught that the Mass is the pinnacle and the summit of worship for the Christian. And we didn't have it. We could sing, we prayed, we listened to sermons. In fact, I have 66 volumes to this day of a preacher in, Brit uh, in uh, London, England in the 1800s. And his name, I think of it just a second. His name, um, oh, I should know that, slip in my tongue. Anyway, he said that there is no form of worship that is higher than a good sermon. 
If you want the highest form of worship that there can be for a Christian, go hear a good sermon. And that is what he said was the best sermon, that, or the best form of worship. And we knew that was wrong. And my wife said, preaching is not worship. God wants us to do something else, but I don't know what it is. And that was the beginning of our conversion. So we started thinking about that. What is worship? What are we supposed to be doing? I have to say that at the end of this period of time of asking these questions, we almost became agnostic. We quit going to any church and we decided just to read the Bible and pray at home. And even then it was a problem because we didn't know, um, I, I wanted to be, I knew there was such a thing as a church, but we didn't know what it was. Okay, so what is worship? Since that point of time, I have learned that all of humankind, no matter where they lived or what period of time, they always believed in a deity or deities, whatever you, they perceive them to be, and they would always bring an offering or a sacrifice to those deities or the deity. And we, worshiping, did not. We also learned, since we've been to all of the most ancient churches in the world, whether it's in Egypt or Israel, Rome, Italy, wherever they are, we think that we have been, maybe there's a few exclusions, I'm not sure, but we think we have been to all of the oldest first churches that were ever built. And I can testify that in those churches, there is only one thing that they all have in common. Some may be round, some may be cruciform shaped, some may be square, some made of wood, brick, or stone. But all of them had one thing in common, and it wasn't the tabernacle. You'd say, well, Steve, that's where the body and blood of Christ is kept. That's the most important thing in the church. No, it's not. The altar is. Because without the altar, there's nothing in the tabernacle. It's at the altar, which is the highest form of sacrifice, where Jesus comes down from heaven, so to speak, and his body and blood is given to us, where we worship with his words that he's given. The mass is not ours. We can't change the mass. God gave us the Mass. It's His Mass. We come there to worship with Him. We are partaking in, within the heavenly realm, and we're partaking of the angels and the saints in this one worship of God. And in a way, like I said in my first talk, heaven comes down to us in the sacrament of the Eucharist. So that worship is something that all churches in the beginning had an altar, and in front of the altar was a priest. And then Martin Luther came along, and after 1,500 years of every church with an altar at the center of everything and a priest in front of the altar, Martin Luther and the others said no. And they got more radical as they went into the centuries after that Protestant deformation. I don't call it a reformation. I call it a deformation. And they said no. And they got rid of the Pope. They said, we don't need the Pope anymore. And they threw the Pope away. And we don't need the traditions and the councils anymore. And they threw them away. And Martin Luther said, I am my own Pope and council. And the next thing they did is they got those altars and they removed the altars. And in their place, they put a podium. And in front of the podium was a preacher. And it was a different religion. And I found myself in a different religion than the early Christians. I found myself in a church without an altar when all churches in the beginning had altars. Where's our altar? Why don't we have an, and why don't we have a priest? All the churches from the beginning, whether you view those churches or whether you read the writings of the very first Christians, Ignatius of Antioch, Polycarp of Smyrna, Clement of Rome, the Didache, Shepherd of Hermas, go on and on. All of it, it's the same, uniformly. And I found myself in a religion that was different from the religion of the first centuries. The fathers of the church, they got to us, those first guys. Okay, so that's worship. A friend of ours named Al Cresta, some of you may know him from Catholic Radio. I'll mention him a bit in a bit. He gave Janet a book called Evangelical is Not Enough by Thomas Howard. And Thomas Howard wrote in that book, as a fundamentalist Protestant who became a Catholic, how he discovered the church through the beauty of liturgy and why evangelical was not enough. There was a whole tradition and liturgy of the church. My wife read, started reading that book and said to me, Steve, this book is saying everything I was thinking but did not have the words to say. And that's what started our journey. The second point, 
what authority is there for the Christian? What is a Christian's authority? For me, Bible alone. Sola Scriptura. I was a Martin Luther Reformation guy. I even had Martin Luther t-shirts with his picture made on them. I was proud of Martin Luther. I was one of his radical Sola Scriptura, Sola Fide, faith alone. And I was against a Catholic church that says otherwise. But what's the authority for the Christian? The Bible alone? Well, that's what I had to struggle with because I told you from the very beginning, I loved the Bible. My mom made me memorize Bible verses, but when I turned 17, I put my whole heart to studying the Bible and did all the way for the rest of my life. And when I started, the more I loved the Bible and the more I studied the Bible, the more the Bible became a problem for me. You can see only a few here now. But if you saw upstairs, I have a whole library upstairs and another whole library downstairs. We have 20,000 books in our house. And you may say, well, why do you have so many books? People say our house is a library with a kitchen. I have those books because my dad first taught me to love reading, to not have television, but to have an insatiable curiosity and to have books that can answer the questions that you come up with. And I had questions about the Bible. I wanted to know exactly what God wanted of me. I wanted to know what the church was. I wanted to know what this was. I wanted to understand all of this. And the more books I bought, I have a whole wall of books just on commentaries, on commentaries on Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, a whole wall of them because I wanted to understand, I wanted to be able to get right down to the original languages and learn what the Bible, what God expected of me and what the church was and how to get say, I wanted to be able to argue to explain it to everybody. So I studied all these books, but the more I studied them, the more I realized there were differing opinions on what the Bible meant. And when I got together with my own good evangelical buddies, my friends in evangelicalism, we spent most of the time arguing because there were different opinions. And we would think, well, who has the final opinion? What if him and I argue and disagree? Some Protestants, evangelicals, think you should baptize infants. Some in the Baptist tradition say that's a wicked Catholic sin. My mom wouldn't baptize me. She went and dedicated me in the Baptist church. You don't baptize, that's a Catholic sin. That's terrible. A man-made tradition. Where do you find that in the Bible? So you have conflicts. Can you lose your salvation once you're saved in a Protestant way, or can you not? I have so many books that say, once you're saved, you can never lose your salvation. And I have just as many say, if you, once you do, if you do this or that, you can lose your salvation. And all of a sudden, I'm reading this book, and I'm thinking the Holy Spirit's interpreting it for me. And I find out now that somebody else who's also reading the book and saying the Holy Spirit's interpreting it for him, we come up with two different conclusions. And there's now like 40,000 different denominations, all of us reading the same book and coming to different conclusions about the polity of the church, the government of a church, what we should do in the church. I think maybe the Holy Spirit was very confused. He lost control. There was supposed to be one church, but now it's all scattered around. The Holy Spirit failed us. But I realized it wasn't the Holy Spirit that failed us. We failed the Holy Spirit because he wanted unity and he wanted no division. But we like stupid sheep went off and decided we were going to rebel. That's what protestant means, protest. We were going to protest. We were going to go off and do it on our own. And I realized all of a sudden that Bible alone would never work. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he had three things. He had first the law of God inscribed in stone, written. He had the oral tradition, the oral Torah, which was never written down. And he also had the chair of Moses, which was a seat of authority. In Exodus 18, it says Moses took his seat and he judged the people. This was when I became interested in the authority issue, became very intriguing because I always have said that the church is the new Israel. And the new Israel would have an authority structure that would be similar to the old Israel. The old Israel had three, were like a three-legged stool. And you need three legs for a stool to stand. If you kick out one tradition or you kick out the other, the magisterium, you end up with a one-legged stool. It won't work. I tried it once in my movie, Apostolic Fathers, and I fell over on my head, just for the sake of the, of the movie, of course. But I realized that in the church, we also have a three-legged stool. First leg is written word of God. The second one is the sacred tradition. 
And the third one is no longer the chair of Moses, it's now the chair of Peter, which was inherited from the chair of Moses. That's another whole discussion we can have sometime on Peter and that kind of a thing. So as we went along, um, this issue of authority became very serious issue for me. And I have to say that in our conversion, the big issues were not purgatory, Mary, the Eucharist, priesthood. The real issue for me, the foundational issue was one of authority. Once I dealt with the issue of authority, all of the other dominoes fell into place. They all worked. The, uh, really quickly, I don't usually do this either, but I still have 45 minutes I see, and I, I have a little more time than I normally do. I like to also say in the second part about what's the authority. You can ask, um, if you are going to build a religion on a book alone, which is what Protestantism did, they said Bible only, there are some problems. And this is why it can't work. Let's say for the first century, you were there when Jesus was raised from the dead and Pentecost came and he went up there. And by the way, at Pentecost, 10 days earlier was the ascension. And what happened at the ascension? Jesus went up into heaven. And the last thing, those guys are talking to him. And when I'm on the Mount of Olives with my groups, I love to tell the story and say, he went up right from here. And he was always on the ground with these guys. Whenever they were, Jesus was always here. He's always on the ground. But this day was different. He starts to go up. And they looked up and the last thing they saw was the bottom of his dirty feet. And they look up and, and he goes into the clouds. But right before he left, before he got in the clouds, he did not turn back around and say, hey guys, before I get into the cloud, one thing to remember, don't forget to read my book. There was no book. There was an Old Testament, of course, but there wasn't what we call the New Testament. Neither did Jesus say there was going to be a book especially not a book that would be added onto the old covenant and would also be inspired and of equal authority with the Torah. Jesus never said there was going to be a book. Jesus never wrote anything down, except for in John chapter eight, he wrote in the sand, but nobody knows what he wrote. He never wrote, he could have written a book. He could have said, this is my book, read it. He knew he was literate, but he didn't yell down and say, don't forget to read my book. What did Jesus leave behind? Not a book. Jesus left behind 12 men. Only 12 men, that's what he left behind. And one of those was carrying the keys of the kingdom. And those 12 men went out and taught. And they were ordained priests in the upper room. And they went out and taught and they practiced the faith. What they taught, and what they practiced was called the apostolic tradition. Tradition is not a bad word. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. What's that? Where did you learn that? From your mother. Where did she learn it? From her mother. From her mother. Everybody sings that. It's a tradition. A tradition is neither good nor bad. It just means the Greek word is paradosis. It means something that is handed on from one generation to the next. What does apostolic tradition mean? The apostles, they, this public revelation ceased with the death of the last apostle, and their words and their practices became the apostolic tradition, which is like a, a, ba a box that's full of banknotes. It's it's good. They left us called the deposit of faith and it belongs in the bank. And what is the bank? It's the church. And they put that deposit of the faith into the church, which is the bank. And from then on, all of the, the apostles and the bishops are in charge of that bank and of distributing and teaching and protecting that deposit of faith. They do not have the right to mess with that deposit of faith or to put their hands in and change it. That deposit of faith goes from one generation with a promise you will not take anything out of this box and you will not add anything to it. This is the apostolic sacred tradition that's being passed on. So the first generation did not have a book. It wasn't written yet. How would you know how to live the Christian life in the first generation if you didn't have the book? 
And I mean the 27 books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 1 Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Second Thessalonians, 1 Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1 Second Peter, 1 Second Third James, June, Revelation. 27 of them. I hope you counted. I hope you counted and I did them right. That wasn't there for the first century. So how did they know? These were the generation that had their heads cut off. They would stand in front of a Colosseum and say, I am a Christian. I will not. And they burned and them to death, fed them to life, but they didn't have the book. How could they live the Christian life without the book? And I had to ask myself this. Then the next generation, now all of the apostles are dead and all the, their, their writings have been written. But do we know which ones are from them? In the next 300 years, there were over 300 books that claim to be from the apostles. You've heard of the gospel of Judas, the gospel of Thomas, and you go on and on. They were written mostly in Greek. There was 250 to 300 of them, all claiming apostolic origins. And so now these early Christians have all of these books. How do they know which ones were inspired? If I put all of you who are listening today into a room with those 300 documents and laid them out in Greek, and I said, look, we don't know which ones are inspired, we're going to have to ask the Holy Spirit to help us because the whole rest of the world is going to depend on our decision. Which one of these, these books are inspired? Are all of them expired, inspired by God or only one? Which one can we use for doctrine and for training in righteousness? Which ones will be added to the Old Testament, which nobody even dreamed of something being added at that point? So would you feel comfortable with all of those books saying together, we're going to form a committee and decide which of these are the... How many of you speak ancient Greek and can read it? First problem is right there. None of us would feel competent to do that, and yet that's what faced the early Christians. The collection of the books of the New Testament were not collected into a binding, what we call a canon or a rule, until the end of the fourth century. So from that 300, for the first 100 years, could you build a religion based on a book? No. For the next 300 years, could you build a religion based on a book? No. There was all these books. Nobody knew exactly which ones. Some were coming to the top. Some were being quoted more often. But churches in the East had different collections and churches of the West. It wasn't until the Catholic councils, and I won't go into all the detail about that. We don't have time. Determined that there were 27 books. And they listed what they were. Those 27 books could be read during the divine liturgy. And do you know we call that book the New Testament? But that's not what was first called the New Testament. The book is called the New Testament because it talks about the real New Testament. New Testament and New, Co New Covenant are the same things. And when Jesus said in the upper room, this, and he holds up the chalice with the wine in it, which he now says is his blood. He said, this is the chalice of my blood. This is the new and everlasting testament. The new testament is the sacrament of the Eucharist. The book talks about the new covenant and explains the readings that you can read during the mass. So the first new testament was actually the Eucharist. And the book only got that name later because it was read during the sacrament and because it explained the new covenant. So now, finally, can we have, once we got them all collected, can now we have a religion based on a book? Yes, we can. They're all, every, it's all written and put together in a collection. No, you can't. Because we didn't have paper yet. There was no such thing as a printing press. You had to, if you wanted your own Bible, from 400 until the printing press was developed in the 1500s. That's a thousand years or more. If you wanted to have your own Bible during that thousand years, you had to kill about a thousand lambs or deer and tan their hide and make vellum. All the ancient books were made out of vellum. Yes, there was papyrus made out of plants, but you wouldn't waste having papyrus to have somebody for three years write all the Bible out on that because that papyrus wouldn't last very long. It was just organic plant material. It would disintegrate. But the vellum from a lamb's hide or a deer's hide would last for a long time if kept in the right temperatures and environment. So if you wanted, and by the way, my dad used to say to me and I was a boy, son, we're going to church on Sunday. See, there's a group of people going into a church. They're real believe they're real believers, son. I said, how do you know, Dad? He said, because they all have Bibles under their arms, son. That one's they're not real believers. How do you know? Because they don't have their Bibles under their arm. They're going to church without a Bible. But could the first generations go to church with a Bible? 
No. For that thousand years, if you wanted your own Bible, it would cost you the equivalent of three years wage. You had to have a thousand sheep or deer have their hides tanned and prepared in vellum, shaped into scrolls or into um, vellum books. And then you'd have to hire somebody for three years to write it all out by hand because there were no Xerox copy machines or printers. It would cost you three years wages for one book. I was always told that the early Christians had to keep their Bibles chained into the churches because, the, that because they didn't want anybody to read them. The Catholics kept them up there in Latin, this mysterious language that no one could read, and they chained them up so no one could ever get to them and read them and find out how really to get saved. And they burned Bibles. They used to burn the Bibles, they said, during the Reformation. Did the Catholic Church burn Bibles? Yes, they did. I used to go to bookstores, used bookstores, and buy a bunch of these New Testaments, and they were greenback New Testaments, and I'd bring them home, as many as I could buy, maybe 10 or 15 of them that were there, and I'd bring them home, and I'd burn them in the fire pit behind our house. Why? Because on the title, it says, The Jehovah's Witnesses New World Translation of the Bible. It is not a Bible. It's a heretical book. In John chapter 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. That's not the Bible. That's a heretical book. So I would buy them and burn them so nobody else would be influenced or infected by that heresy. So the Catholics did burn Bibles that many people wrote that were inferior, wrongly translated, or had wrong theology put in the footnotes. They didn't want the church has always viewed herself as the mother responsible for what her children read and know. And they don't want those heretical books out there. So yes, the Catholic church did burn some of those books, but not the true word of God that she printed, and accurately so. Did they keep them chained up? Yes, they did. Why? Because if a Bible is worth three years wages, and it's not chained and protected, that thing's going to end up on eBay next week. Somebody's going to make three years wages selling that Bible on eBay. So of course, even in the universities, the, philosoph the philosophic writings of Aristotle and Plato were also chained to the tables, not to keep people from getting to them, but to make sure there was always one there when you went there to read it. And each diocese would have Bibles in select places and churches. They were expensive. Why do they chain? So that at that parish, they would always have a Bible that they could come there to read or that the priest could. And during that period of time, could you have your own Bible, even if you could afford it, when 90% of the people were illiterate and couldn't read? How can you have a religion based on a book when most of the people can't even read? That's why when you went to the churches, you would hear preached at mass. You would hear the readings from the Gospels. You may not ever hear those again. Do you think you would listen to the difference of the reading and the Psalms differently if you thought, I can't read, I don't have a Bible, but I want to remember what I just heard of the Word of God? You would memorize that. And you would take it home and sit at the table and away walking home to the farm. You'd all go over those verses and memorize them because you didn't have it at home. And the, the stained glass and the statues in the churches were called the Gospel of the Poor. So that grandma could bring her little kids in. She's wearing her babushka and her old long dress. And she says, children, see, there's where Mary took Jesus on a, on a donkey, Joseph. And they went and had the baby Mary. And, there's, and then the little child says, grandma, wh why did they put that man up there and put nails in his hand? Why, why did they do that? To, that's mean, grandma. And grandma said, that's Jesus who died for us. And she can't read a word of scripture. She doesn't own her own Bible, but she has the gospel of the poor in the statues and the stained glass of the churches. And now we hear about people wanting to tear down statues that tell our national history. And they're even now coming into the churches trying to destroy them too. Don't you dare let the gospel of Jesus Christ out into the world. We're told today as Catholics to keep our mouths shut. And that's what we're gonna talk about tomorrow in my talk, Swimming Upstream. But anyway, then now, after the printing press is invented, now can we, and we have the list of books, can now we finally have a religion based on a Bible alone? No, because that went out there and everybody now thought they could read it for themselves. They didn't need a church. Luther said every plowboy and servant girl can read the word of God for themselves. 
And that's what they did. Everybody went out and began to read for themselves and they didn't have to listen to a church. They threw away the Pope and the councils. Now they could just read it and they came up with as many theologies as there were heads. That's exactly what Martin Luther said towards the end of his death. There are now as many theologies as are heads as there are heads. Everyone says they have the Holy Spirit for themselves. They've eaten the Holy Spirit, feathers and all. And towards the end of his life, he was depressed because he said there are now, everybody's going after this or they're going after their own way. And they didn't all follow him. He wanted them all to follow him with his new interpretation of the Bible. So there's a whole thing that I realized there's no way you can build a, a book Bible on a book. It had to be the three-legged stool of scripture. Yes, the inspired word of God, the sacred tradition as maintained in the church and the magisterium of the church, the official interpreter. Who's the official interpreter of the Protestant churches? Nobody. Nobody would claim that. When Martin Luther got rid of one pope, he created a billion new popes because every protestant has become their own pope and they are responsible for their own theology. I was Pope Steve and Janet was Pope Janice. Pope is Janet. And there are now a billion popes who think that they have the final word on scripture. That brings me to my last point of how many churches did Jesus start? I read now, or think now that he said, I will build my church, not my churches. And he said, if a brother sins against you, take it to your brother. If he doesn't listen, take it to two or three. Now we're getting legislative and judicial. This is the legislature of Israel. The civic law of Israel was they had courts and a Sanhedrin. And if you went to your brother and tried to straighten it out with him and he wouldn't listen, then you would take witnesses to the court. And if he didn't listen to the court, Jesus said, there's even a higher authority. Take it to the church. The church. He didn't say the churches or one of the churches. He said, take it to the church. And if you sin against me and we have a problem and you're a Baptist and I'm a Methodist, what church are we going to take it to to adjudicate between the two of us? Your church has no authority over mine and my church has no authority over yours. And this whole denominational thing makes a farce and a scandal of Jesus's words Take it to the church. The church has to be a physical entity with an address and with judicial legislative powers. This is what it means to bind and loose. These are Jewish terms for legal proceedings. And in the upper room, this is something interesting. Most people don't realize this. And I don't have proof for this, but I think it's very apropos and very clear. In the upper room, how many people there? 120. But Luke doesn't say 120 people. He said there were about 120 names. Very strange way. If I take a bus of pilgrims, I say I have 50, about 50 names on my bus. Why that? I do a search. I told you earlier, I have a program called Verbum on here, and I can do searches in the Bible for things. So I can also search all the ancient Jewish history. So I target just, I want Jewish sources from the first century, anywhere where it says 120. Because I'm thinking if Luke says about 120 names, it almost acts like he's talking about names on a list. So I want to know if there's anything significant with 120. Well, what I found out is that one of the rabbis taught that if you want to leave your big city or community and go out into the country and start your own new city, civic um, organization with your own courts and judges and legislature, if you want to start your own, you need a minimum of 120 people. And what's happening in the upper room? The people of God in the upper room, after being filled with the Holy Spirit, the word church is ecclesia, the called out ones. They're being called out to start a new community. And according to Jewish law, they needed 120 people to do that. And today, to this very day, how many members are there in the Jewish Knesset in Jerusalem? 120. So how many churches did Jesus start? Janet and I realized, I got to cut it short now because I only got 22 minutes, uh, 27 minutes left. Janet and I realized that Americans today choose their restaurants like they, they choose their churches like they choose their restaurants. So Monday afternoon, Janet and I are driving down the street and we see Taco Bell, Burger King, McDonald's, and uh, KFC chicken. And I say to my wife, what do you feel like today? 
She says, I feel like chicken. Oh, okay, we'll go. I pull in and we go into KFC. Maybe tomorrow she'll feel like a hamburger. Sunday morning comes around and we're driving down Main Street. And on the other side of the street, we have Methodist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Assemblies of God, all the way down the list, Pentecostals. And I say to my wife, what do you feel like today? And we choose our church the same way we choose our restaurant. Maybe we want to contracept and abort. Guess what? There's a church on Main Street that will gladly go along. Oh, you can join us. We're happy, clappy about Jesus, but we don't interfere in your bedroom. We don't interfere in your moral life. We're not going to meddle. You just decide for yourself. Oh, I like that. Aren't we all supposed to decide for ourselves? So I don't choose a church based on what the truth is, or if Jesus started a church and he imposes his morals on us through his church. I come with, a, with the basic premise that I'm the one who chooses. I decide what's moral for me and my wife, and we find a church that makes us happy. And as soon as it doesn't make us happy, we're going to sh jump ship and we're going to go to the one next door. And that's what happens in Protestantism. There's a lot of two-way traffic, three-way traffic, stealing sheep going back and forth. And now you've got the big mega churches that hold five or 10,000 people, these wonderful reclining chairs like theaters. And you can get your cappuccino when you come in and you have a little coffee cup holder and you can drink your cappuccino while you're watching the service. Maybe that's what I feel like today. And Christianity has become what is my preference, what I decide is right. And I knew that, Janet and I knew that wasn't right, well, the right way. It couldn't be. So here we have, what is worship? What is the authority for the Christian? And how many churches did Jesus start? And we realized that the Protestant churches could not answer that. And if we fixed it, it would become Catholic. And for about a year, we quit going to church. I couldn't go anymore and be a hypocrite. We loved the Bible and we loved Jesus, even though when we realized these problems, it undermined our assurances. And then, right when we were almost becoming agnostic, a friend of mine named Al Cresta, who was a Protestant pastor and a Protestant radio talk show host in Detroit, the number one radio talk show host celebrity in, Mich in Michigan, Al, uh, Al Cresta talked from the heart on WMUZ 103.5. I can still say it. He used to be with us. We've been best friends for 12 years, spent most of the Sundays with us because we lived in the country. He lived in downtown Detroit and they'd come out to swim and ride our horses. And we had a great time to Bible studies and homeschooled our kids together. One day in 1993, without any preparation whatsoever, he drops the bomb on us. And he said, Steve, Sally and I have decided to go and join the Catholic church. <laughs> I said, after catching my breath. Al, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. You're way too smart to be a Catholic. What are you thinking of? And he says, well, we've been thinking and praying on it long and hard, and we've decided to go back to our roots and go back to the Catholic Church. Janet and I said, we're not going to talk to him about it. He'll learn his lesson. He's going to go sit in the pews with all that dead wood. He'll learn his lesson. They don't read their Bibles. They don't even know how to sing in the Catholic Church. He'll learn his lesson. And in the meantime, we'll study to prove him wrong. So Janet and I started studying all of these issues. When the first thing, I, first thing I wanted to do was go to the early Christians, the very first Christians, because I was always taught and I was certain that the earliest Christians were proto-Protestants. Then those Protestants came out of the shoots in the first century, pure and pristine, biblical, and only later did they get corrupted with Catholic ideas. This is something that's just understood by an evangelical Protestant. There's not, you, you don't, it's nothing to be argued. It's just understood. So I went back and began to read the writings of the early Christians. I was going to prove to Al that they were really Protestants, but guess what? Janet and I found out they were not Protestants. They were very Catholic. And what we teach and believe in the catechism today in its full blown form, you can find in the first two or three centuries in its nascent form. In other words, an oak tree doesn't become an oak tree overnight. The seed is planted on the day of Pentecost, and then a little shoot starts up, and then a little sapling it turns into. But that little sapling is an oak tree, and organically, it is fully much an oak tree as the big one at the end. And the church grew organically 
into the big, beautiful Catholic church now that covers over a billion people on the whole face of the earth. But if you go back and try to look at it at the beginning and say, that doesn't look like the Catholic Church of today, well, I'll tell you what, you go back and look at my baby pictures and they don't look like I look like today. If the church stayed the baby, then something's bad wrong. If I'm still like I look and act like I did when I was six months old, you're going to say, this kid's got some problems. And the church was never intended to be small sapling and just have a whole bunch of saplings. That one organic tree was supposed to grow. Like Jesus said, you plant the smallest seed in the ground and it grows into a huge tree and all the birds of the world can nest in its branches. That's the Catholic Church. So we studied the early fathers of the church. Long story short, they dragged Janet and I into the Catholic Church with our arms tied behind our back because if I could find a missing link in the chain, you've got the, the apostles, then you've got the first century apostolic fathers, then you've got, if I could find a missing link in the chain, then I didn't have to become Catholic. But when you take Catholicism today and you go work your way back, there's an unbroken line all the way back to Jesus and no other church can tell you that. Martin Luther started the Lutherans in the 1500s. Baptists in the 1600s with a guy named Smith. All of them have somebody who started them much later. You want to look for the founder. Even, even uh, you ask the Amazon Alexa. I don't want to say it too loud or she'll start talking. But you ask her, who started the Lutheran church? Martin Luther started the Lutheran church in 1500. Who started the Catholic church? Jesus Christ in 33 AD. They're probably going to have to change that now because they're very liberal. They're not going to want their computer program saying that. But up until now, that's what it, the answer is. So we read the fathers of the church, and we realized that the early church was very Catholic. So we did all of this work, and it, it kind of culminated. Janet and I took each topic, the papacy, the priesthood, purgatory, the Eucharist, Mary, one at a time. And every time we said, oh, my goodness, the Catholic church was right on that, too. I don't have time to go through the quotes of all the fathers. In my book, Crossing the Tiber, it's my conversion story. I'll, I, I should have had it here to show you. But in my book, Crossing the Tiber, it's for sale on my website. I go through all of these quotes. I tell the whole story of, of how we converted and all of the fathers of the church that we discovered along the way. The middle of the book is all about baptism from scripture in the first four centuries. And the last third of the book is all about the Eucharist from scripture in the first four centuries. But I have to kind of race to the end here. On New Year's Eve, 1993, we went to some friend's house. He's the guy, if you were listening to my first talk, that wanted me to eat the Eucharist and vomit it up. He was the scientist. So he invited us over to his house, and he was going to argue with us. He saw our lunacy that we were heading towards the questions we were asking, the books that we were reading. He was going to save us from our lunacy. So he invited us to come over to his house. On New Year's Eve, and we talked and we argued all night. Well, after midnight, I said, Jim, we got to go home. But I just want to summarize this way. I said, do you realize that if you and I were alive at the death and resurrection of Jesus, and we saw the risen Christ, that you and I would have never read the gospel of St. John? He says, why not? I said, because it wouldn't be written yet. The book of St. John was not written until about 100 A.D., under the reign, the reign of Trajan, the emperor. We wouldn't have read it, Jim. And that's the book that tells us about being born again. John chapter three, verse three, you must be born again. And Nicodemus said, how can I be born again? Do I need to go back in my mother's womb? And Jesus said, unless a man is born of water and spirit, he will never see the kingdom of God. John chapter three, verse five. How would we have known how to get born again that there was such a thing, Jim, if we didn't even have that book yet? And I'm driving home that night, and I said to Janet in the dark, this is getting very scary. She said, what? And I said, the more we argue against the Catholic Church, the more I'm convinced that the Catholic Church is right. And we're arguing against the church, but finding ourselves backing in backwards right in the front door. The next day was New Year's Day. We had all our books out on the living room floor. Janet was studying about Mary. I was studying about apostolic succession. We were listening to some conversion stories on old cassette tapes. Remember what they were? I mean, nobody even uses those anymore. It's going to be in a museum someday. Cassette tape, something Steve Ray used. And we were listening to conversion stories. And I remember closing all my books about two in the afternoon. And I sat down on the floor and I started to cry like a baby. Tears were running down my cheeks. And Janet looked over. This is not usual. Janet looks over and she said, Steve, what is wrong? And I said, Janet, 
nothing's wrong. I just realized I'm a Catholic. And she said, oh, good grief. <laughs> but she said the same thing as I did 12 hours later. I called Al Cresta when I stopped crying and I said, Al Cresta, remember I told you you were crazy a year ago, but guess what, Al, happy new year and I'm a Catholic. Hello, are you there, Al? Hello? Yeah, I'm here. What did you just say? I said, I'm a Catholic. What happened? I said, my pride broke. I'm no longer the center, the Pope of everything. I realized Jesus started a kingdom. And he's the king and he started a kingdom and it's called the Catholic Church. And I want to be a member. I'm now going to give all my obedience and fealty to the king and his kingdom. Al said, how would you like to go to mass with us on Sunday? It never dawned on me for two seconds that if I was going to read my way into the Catholic Church, which is exactly what we did, we didn't talk to anybody, we read our way into the Catholic Church, that if I was going to read my way into the Catholic Church, that someday I'd have to go to a Catholic Mass. I never even, that didn't connect. So I covered the phone and I said, Janet, he wants us to go to a Catholic Mass with him tomorrow, it's Sunday, what should I tell him? Janet's a very smart lady. She said, tell him we'll go but we're going to leave the kids at home. We want to get to mass late. We're going to sit in the back row and we're going to leave early before it's over. And people laugh and say, wow, you guys are real American Catholics from the first day. But Al didn't keep his promise. He got us there early and he took us all the way up to the second row. And I was sitting on the aisle and Janet and I sat there. I remember looking straight ahead. We didn't look to left or right. She sat right on my right hand. I still remember today. And we sat there, and I remember thinking, dear God, please don't strike me down with lightning. I'm only here to see. I'm only here to learn. I was afraid that I was going to get in trouble for being there. God was going to strike me down. And the, all of a sudden, the music started, and everybody turned around and looked to the back. And they never did that in our other churches. So I thought, sure, something was wrong. So I stepped out of my aisle, and I looked back to see what was wrong. But there wasn't anything wrong. You know what I saw. I saw the priest coming up the aisle and the Holy Scriptures, the Gospels being held up. And as that priest walked by, I did not know who he was. I didn't know his name or I did not know who he was, but I knew exactly who he was and exactly what he was. He was a priest of the Most High God that had hands of a bishop laid on him from a bishop, bishop, all the way back to the apostles. And I was in the midst of an apostolic man in his presence. And when he kept the, I started the ball again. I was just standing in the aisle, go, <laughs> crying. And I know he thought I was crazy. And I looked at Janet and she was crying too. And when we left that mass, we cried through the whole mass. And I have to say that we cried at every single mass for the next six years. And I still do at times. Now it's getting better now. It's getting better. But I still cry especially at the creed, one holy Catholic and apostolic church. That gets me every time. And the Eucharist. When we started to leave, Janet clenched her little fists and she said, I am so angry. Well, anybody who knows my wife knows that that is shocking conduct from her. She doesn't do that. I am so angry. Why are you angry? You had the same, you cried through the whole thing like I did. She said, I'm angry at my Protestant past for lying to me about the Catholic Church, but I'm even angrier at the Catholics because they knew all of this and never had the guts to tell us we were wrong. And if you take that as a challenge, good. We went out and there's the priest. His name was Father Red. I said, hello, Father Red. My name is Steve Ray. This is my wife, Janet. We found your name here in this bulletin thing. And so nice to meet you. We just became Catholics yesterday. I paused there because at that point, a lot of people laugh. Just like he did. What do you mean you became Catholic yesterday? I said, we did. We became Catholic yesterday. and We want to join the church this week so we can have Holy Communion next Sunday. I was dead serious. He says, well, what do you mean you became Catholic yesterday? I said, I was. We've been studying for a year. I said, we had all our books out yesterday. I realized that the Catholic Church is the church Jesus founded, and we want to get into it now. And my wife just realized that today. She was crying in the mass like I was, and she said, Steve, I'm a Catholic now too. So we're coming back to you to let you know that we want to become Catholic this week so we can have Holy Communion next Sunday. And he just looked at me like, I never met anybody like you before. He said, well, that's not the way we do it around here. I said, well, how do you do it around here? 
And he said something about RCIA. You have to go to these RCIA classes and if, for two years. And if you pass, then you can become Catholic on Easter vigil two years from now. Well, I drove the poor man crazy. I kept calling him every time I'd say, okay, Father Ed, let's, let's try this way. You come over to my house. I'll show you all the books that I've read. You tell me whatever else I need to read, and I'll read them this week. It's not the way we do it around here, he said. Well, finally, about probably February, early March, I get a call from Father Red, and he says, Steve, come over to the rectory, bring your wife, be there at 10 o'clock. So we jumped in the car, we drove over to the rectory. He didn't even invite us in. He just handed us tests, two tests. He said, fill out this test. You're not allowed to talk to each other while you're filling it out. You're not allowed to look anything up in any books. And I want it back here by 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Okay. And he shut the door. And we got in the car. We have these two tests, a 35-page test. They were what he, the principal of the high school, that he would give to religion teachers who had to prove that they knew enough to become a religion teacher in a high school. Janet got in the car. She said, this is not fair. No other church has ever treated us like this. Well, we went home and we filled it out. We took him back at 10 o'clock the next morning and we got a call about a week later and said, Steve, how would you like to come into the church on Pentecost Sunday, May 22nd, 1994? So May 22nd, 1994, this priest, Father Ed, brought our family into the Catholic church. There's my little daughter, Emily getting baptized. She now has two kids of her own, but there she was, a little girl and just out of diapers, and we were Catholic, and we never have looked back. But I want to digress just a moment. I only have 10 minutes left and 20 minutes to talk, but I'll get it done. We, my dad, my daughter, let's start this way, my daughter and my son, 16 years old and 13, they're PhD, and they're smart now, and they got 4.0s after homeschooling. We homeschooled all of them, Janet did, and they went to university and got 4.0, and they're smart kids, but when she was 16, her and Jesse, they said, Dad, we're not going to join the Catholic Church with you. I said, why not? She said, Dad, do you forget what you taught us at homeschooling? You taught us about church history and history of religion and homeschooling. Do you remember what you taught us about the Catholic Church, and you think we're going to join it now? I said, touche, good point. So I'm going to digress one more step back. My dad, when he heard that we were reading Catholic books and thinking about this, he was so angry, he clenched his fist and he says, you must be living in sin. You must be backslidden even to think of these things. So I sat down on this computer here, although it's a later version now, and I started typing a letter and it started out, dear dad, you're the best father in the world and I owe you an explanation. And I typed out and typed out and I started putting in the fathers of the church quotes so he would know why and who they were and the Bible verses and all this. And it, I typed and typed it and that became my book, Crossing the Tiber. My book, Crossing the Tiber, I'll show it to you tomorrow when I'm on. But my book, Crossing the Tiber was never going to be a book. It was a love letter to my dad. And I had just finished writing the most of it. I had most of it written before I was ever in the church. And I said to my daughter, Cindy, I just wrote a letter for grandpa. Will you proofread it for me before I send it? I may be dumb, but I'm not stupid. And I went to the old dot matrix printer and I typed out that letter and printed it out. And I gave it to her. I said, here, proofread this before I send it to grandpa. Her and my son, Jesse, went upstairs all day. They didn't come down for dinner. And about 10 o'clock at night, Janet wanted to go get them, said they got to eat their food. I said, leave them alone, leave them alone. 10 o'clock at night, they came down with tears in their eyes and those pages were soaked with their tears. They said, dad, it's a good letter. We decided we're going to join with you. So on May 22nd, 1994, all six of us were received into the Catholic church with all the sacraments. And that was 26 years ago. There were six of us. Now I think we're 28 strong. We're going to add to the church, not just by evangelism, but by having babies and bringing them up in the faith. Now, one last thing. I've got seven minutes left. I wanted to know to, by, from God how I'm supposed to think about Protestants now. When I was a Cath, uh, Protestant, I had my guns aimed on the, on the Catholics. Now that I'm a, Cat, a Catholic, do I just now swing my guns over and aim them at the Protestants? What do I think about them? So I asked God to help me understand it. I laid in bed and a story came to my mind called The Ship and the Rafts. I'm going to do it very quickly and this will be the end. 
Imagine the founder of a country starts a beautiful country on the other side of the ocean called the celestial city with streets paved with gold. And he comes back to the old country and he says, I've made this beautiful city. I'm finishing it up. I'd like to take you. How many of you would like to go with me? I've built a beautiful ship and I'll put you on this ship and I'll take you across the oceans and across the, the centuries and I'll get you to my new city. And a whole bunch of people say they will. The ship is the Catholic church. The, clerk, the, the captain is the Pope. The clergy are the crew. There's water, food, everything you need. The water is the baptism and the, the grace that flows from the sacraments of the church. The Holy Spirit dwelling in us is always referred to as water. Brings new life, right? And then you have the food. What's the food? The blessed sacrament of the altar. They even have showers on this ship. What are the showers? Well, confession, of course. When you get dirty, you need to get cleaned up. And they have all of the uh, maps and the compasses and the GPS, the scripture and the tradition are all of the, the navigational equipment you need to get across to the other side. And he says, how many of you want to go? Well, a bunch get on the ship. We'll go, we'll go. And he says, okay, but I want to tell you something first. There's going to be a lot of problems on this ship. There's going to be problems from without. There's going to be storms that hit this ship that toss it back and forth. You're going to think it's going to be smashed into driftwood. But I promise if you stay with my ship, I'll get you to the other side. There's going to be problems on the inside as well. There's going to be those who are part of the clergy and the crew who don't act like they are. There are going to be some of them even abusers or teach wrong things. Not many, but there will be some and they'll cause problems. And there's going to be people who don't take their showers. And they're going to start smelling bad. And there's going to become problems problems and their fights. And, but I promise if you stay with my ship, I'll get you to the other side. And they all say, we'll go. And he takes a bottle of champagne, smashes it on the side of the ship. And he christens her the Catholic church and sends her off through the centuries. But all along the way, people are singing, praise the Lord, the Lamb of God, singing in hallelujah. But about 1,500 years into the voyage, 1,500 years later, Protestant deformation, some people get disgruntled in the ship and they said, who is the captain to tell us what to do, even in our own bedrooms? And we're getting tired of the same old food. And these people are starting to smell bad and we're getting in more fights and I'm getting sick and tired. We could get there on our own. So they go down in the belly of the ship and they find wood and ropes and they lash them together and they make rafts. And they throw the rafts overboard at night and they jump off the board. They are protestants now. They are rebels. They're going to protest and they're on their own. They're going to get to the celestial city on their own. Well, how many rafts are there around the ship right now? Well, probably about 40,000 different denominations. And the closer they stay to the ship, the better chance they have to get to the other side. But the farther they drift away in doctrine and practice and morals, the less chance they're going to have to get to the other side. And let me ask you a question. Everything they have good on their raft, where'd they get it from? Everything good they have on their raft, they got it from the ship. Nobody told me as a protestant that everything good I had as a Christian, I had gotten from the Catholic Church, the canon of scripture, the definition of the Trinity. All of the beautiful things that I had as the foundation of our Protestantism came from the Catholic Church. And I wasn't one who jumped off the ship onto a raft. I was born on a raft. I didn't even know there was a ship. Until one day we look over and there's something big on the horizon. And I say to Janet and the people on my raft, what's that over there? Well, they say, I don't know. What? I've never seen that before. So we yell over to the other. I say, hey, what's that thing over there on the horizon? And they all said back, we don't want to talk about it. Why don't you want to talk about it? Because it's the ship. The ship? What do you mean there's a ship? If there's a ship, why am I at a raft? So we, we paddle our raft over to that ship. And for a year, 1993, for a year, we went around and around that ship, looking at it from every angle. And finally, on New Year's Day, 1994, I see a rope hanging off that ship, and I grab my family in one hand, and that rope in another, and I pull ourselves up on the deck of the ship. And now I'm on the deck of the Catholic Church, and that's where I'm going to live the rest of my life. I'm going to be buried on the deck of the Catholic Church. So what do I do? I go to the captain, and I say, Captain, Captain. I know those rebels out there, those protestants. So let's load the cannons and blast them out of the water. <laughs> That's not what I do. Vatican II tells us that the people out on the rafts, if they name the name of Christ and they recite the creed with me and they're willing to be baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and shed their blood for this Savior of our, I, they're my brothers and sisters, though separated from the ship. Out there are my mom and dad. I don't want to shoot them off the raft. 
and out there are my brothers and sisters. And let's face it, some of the people on the rafts can sing better than the people on the, on the ship. So what I say to the captain is I want you to give me a big megaphone, the biggest speakers you have on the ship, and I want to call out to those people and tell them, hey, you out on the rafts. I used to be on a raft, but I found the ship. You should really all come back and look at this. I'm inviting you all to come back to the ship and then we can have ecumenism, real ecumenism, where we're all part of one ship going to one place and having one meal together. And sometimes when I have time, I turn around and I look to the people on the deck of the ship and I say, why are you grumbling? Why are you complaining? Don't you realize where you are? And that's why I'm a Catholic. Thanks for listening. God bless you. I, sister, can you hear me? I can hear you, Steve. I'm very obedient. I got done right at 530. Oh, I am so impressed. Thank you so much. You're great. Well, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. Thank you so much for sharing all that.